have the privilege of hearing from Rick Morgan. Rick has been a resident of Spring Arbor Township for 25 years as he served in this church as youth pastor and then came over across the street. He's been serving as um, the liaison for churches for Spring Arbor and our camp that we own down in Hillsdale called Machindo uh, Conference Center. And he's been serving both of those institutions for the last eight years. And Rick has um, had a couple of kids graduate from Spring Arbor. And what I appreciate most about Rick is not that he's just a good speaker, not just that he loves his family, but that in the midst of life, he values prayer in every way. He has spent time praying for you this morning. I know, though I was kind of rushing back and forth between some things that I was doing this morning and coming over here, I know that he has been through these aisles, through the pews, that he has prayed for you and prayed that what the what message the Lord has laid on his heart would be something that you would value and might even receive this morning. So as we begin our, to worship together and as we begin um, kind of setting our heart to hear from the Lord this morning, I'm going to ask Rick to come down and I'm going to ask students to come and surround him and, and we're going to lift our voices in prayer, um, fill the 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 throne room of heaven with our voices and our prayers this morning. Let's, let's do that uh, out loud. If you would join us all in praying this morning for Rick and for our time together. Let's pray. Father, we come before you on this day, pausing here in the, the mid-morning time that we might direct our hearts, our minds, that we may, might direct our paths in this day toward you and your kingdom. And so as we lift our voices in worship, singing our prayers, May our worship be an offering to you. And as we worship as a community, unified in spirit, would you also speak to us in the middle of our worship? Would you speak to our hearts? And as Rick comes to share his message, the message that you've been cultivating in his heart and in his life, would we, your children, have open hearts and open minds that we might hear directly from you? And as we leave this place, may that message be something that we use to nurture our relationship with you, the God of the universe who knows us intimately, who loves us deeply. Help us to understand better your grace and your truth. For we ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You rescue me. 
the grave, you cross and divide. Lost in our sin, you made us alive. How can we ever hold it inside? We can't hold back. We're gonna lift you higher, higher. Hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make me louder, louder. Never gonna stop singing.
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God And all it chases me down, fights till I found least the night and I and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God And all it chases me down, fights till I found, leaves the night and I And I couldn't earn it 
and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away in all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, now you won't tear down, coming after me. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away in all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Jesus, thank you for your constant pursuit after our hearts. Thank you for lighting up the darkness that's around us, for seeking after us, for calling us your children, calling us your own. Lord, we praise you for the comfort that we can take in knowing that we're your children, knowing that you recklessly love us, that you've not abandoned us, and you never will. Jesus, as we transition into this time of hearing from Rick. God, prepare our hearts for what you have to say to us. Jesus, we're ready to hear from you. We're ready to receive from you this morning. God, would you convict us? God, help us to respond this morning to you in the ways that you are calling us and leading us to go throughout the day. Oh, thanks, guys. You guys are amazing. I can't think of a better way to 
start off than getting to worship with you. I love the way you worship. Get the privilege of doing this all over the place as I travel and represent you to prospective students. Uh, but there's nothing better than getting to do it here. As a youth pastor for 20 years, I loved having a group to call my own. It's really rough to travel on the road when you don't know people and they look at you and say, yeah, tell me something I don't know and then never have to pay attention to you again because you're just a guest speaker. But here I get to be with you uh, and, and I love that. Thank you. I love you guys. Um, soccer team, way to go. Mikey, nice save. Mother, put me in my grave with... Uh, Taking us to 0-0 zero, zero and double overtime. I'm not happy about that, but congrats. Uh, in, my, uh, in my real life, uh, my other life, I'm a soccer referee. Why didn't anybody clap? Because nobody claps for the referees. <laughs> I do that more now as a spiritual discipline because I get that same reaction. Every time you say it, everybody looks at you and says, why do you possibly... You can't get paid enough, and you're right, we don't. And it's, uh, it's more of a spiritual discipline now that I do it because uh, I recognize of the many uh, faults that I have, and, and they are many and sometimes obvious. I, I like to be liked by people a little too much, and I don't like people hollering at me. And so when you go be a referee, you recognize that half of the time, no matter what you do, half of the audience doesn't like you will be hollering at you, um, and it's amazing. Well, a couple weeks ago, I, uh, I was refing a game just out here, a couple U10, U12 girls, something like that, and I know you won't believe this, but U12 parents are crazy. They think that it's the World Cup, and it's not, but there's this little girl. She's out on the field, and I'm the AR of this, running along the sideline with my flag, and this little girl starts weeping out on the field, which isn't too unusual at that level, Unfortunately, she gets taken off the field, and she is beside me, behind I'm running back and forth, and I just hear her talking to her friends beside her, and she's just going, my dad won't shut up. My dad won't shut up. And she's just weeping and weeping and weeping. And I hear the whole thing going on. She finally pulls herself together, comes up to midfield, and I'm going to let her back into the game. And, uh, and I said, hey, you just... Can I just say, as the referee, that you, I know you're going to grow to hate someday as you grow up. You need to say something to your dad because we lose it sometimes. And he needs to know this. And it occurred to me that was exactly uh, what I want to tell you today. I chose those songs on purpose. What we think dad thinks about us writes the script. Right? <laughs> we can leave. What we think dad thinks about us writes the script. Genesis chapters 1 and 3, I'm going to unpack that a little bit today. And I want to give you the blueprint that I think God has put in mind for you and me. And I want to tell you what dad thinks. Because most of you know it and don't believe it. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> and you know he takes all of Genesis chapter 1 to explain what those things are. Creates sun, creates moon, separates light, darkness, separates land, sea, creates livestock. I don't know why he highlights livestock, but that's one of the things that he writes in there. And then he says it creates sea monsters. That's the word that's in your Bible there. Isn't that interesting? But what is most intriguing to me and what I want to highlight, I have a brilliant grasp of the obvious this morning. He says that it's good. He describes everything that he makes as good. And one thing occurs to me particularly, he doesn't describe it as perfect. Isn't that interesting? Perfect God has just created everything, and after everything that he makes, and, and especially after mankind, he creates man and woman, he says, oh, that's, that's very good. But he doesn't say it's perfect. Why? I think there's a number of reasons, but one I want to focus on really simply is this. Perfect indicates that something is finished and that it cannot be improved upon. Some of you are living that way. God did not set the standard from day one that you cannot be improved upon. In fact, that's the expectation for all of creation. He creates creation in such a way that it keeps creating. We have volcanoes making new land now. That was part of the good 
that it keeps going. Creation keeps creating. And your goal and my goal is not perfection because it's never been the goal from day one. I want to free some of you today. Some of you are living with this weight on you, looking at God in heaven, looking at dad on the sidelines, thinking that you're not allowed to mess up. Wasn't the plan from day one. From day one, God says, this is simple, friends, not rocket science. You're good. Own that. Take it. Believe it. Then he moves on to day seven, and he says God starts to rest. Why does God rest? We've got to ask the question, why does God rest? Is he tired? No, God doesn't get tired. Does he run out of ideas? No, God is endlessly creative. In fact, as we've seen, he makes things so that creation keeps going. Why does God rest? There's a number of reasons. I just want to focus on one. A brilliant grasp of the obvious because what he had done in six days was enough. That's deep. Deep, but painfully simple. What he had done in six days was enough because he knew you and me, and he knew that from day one, if he said that we got to keep doing more and more and more, that we would take that on ourselves and we would say, yep, I can earn it. I got to do more. I got to do more prayer. I got to do more Bible study. One of the greatest privileges I have is mentoring some of you one on one. Love to do that with some more of you. But almost all of you have this thing in common. You'll come in and you just say, "Rick, I'll say, how's your journey with Jesus this week?" And you automatically go to, "I'm not doing enough prayer. Sorry, Rick. I'm not in the Bible enough. I need to do. More. I need no." And then I say to every one of you, "No, no, no, no. This isn't about what you should do. God is not the God of shoulds." God is not the one up there saying, please, please, please keep all of these rules and then you will earn my favor. No, from day one, what's God say? (laughs) You are good and you are enough. But notice when, (laughs) notice when, before, before Adam and Eve do anything. Before they do anything, you are good, you are enough. But you know the story, right? (laughs) Sin enters. We've got to say to ourselves, wait a minute, God just said we're good. God just said we're enough. But what's God going to do when we sin? What's God think about me when we sin? That's what this story unpacks for us. Now, trade places with Satan. I think this is really intriguing. Satan's got this problem. The devil's got this problem. I need to get to God. I can't get to God one-on-one. I'm not powerful enough, so i got to do something to his kids. That's where i got to mess with. Now, I'm not creative at all because God's the one who's creative. So I can only take what God has created and I have to distort that and lie about it and, and make people think something that's not really real. Here's the problem. Adam and Eve are the only two people on the face of the planet, in the history of the planet, that can say this phrase. I have everything. Trade places with Satan. How do you go to somebody that has everything and convince them that everything isn't enough. You might be shaking your head and saying, yeah, that's really stupid. Tell you think back to those recurring sins in your life, right? You see, when everything isn't enough, then nothing's enough. And when everything isn't enough, then the only thing left is God, to be God. And so what does Satan do? He comes in and he says, oh, I can get you this way. Here's the only thing you don't have. Your eyes can be opened. And you can be like God. It was power from the beginning. It was, are you going to trust me? Are you going to live in intimacy with God? By the way, bonus material, for which we were created. That's it. We were created for intimacy with God. Are you going to believe that, live in that, do all that you can to continue that relationship? Or are you going to say, no, I'm going to do it my way? Bonus material number two. Isn't it interesting that we don't know what the fruit was? I think... This is intriguing because God's putting this blueprint in place from the beginning and he knew what we Christians would do with a particular sin and in this case with a particular fruit. And let's say it was a pear. You know what we would do, right? What would we do with all pears for the next 3,000 years? We would burn every pear because, of course, the original sin was a pear, so we're not allowed to talk about pears. You see, oh, we're so good, my friends, at lifting up the particular sins of which we don't struggle with. And we highlight those and we'll say, let me convict you about sleeping with your girlfriend or fill in the blank. I don't got to do that because that's God's job. 
So God doesn't even focus on that. We never get to hear what the fruit is or even come back to it. What we do know is that sin has a different definition than I think you have it in your mind. Sin is really simply this. If we were created for intimacy, then all sin is is the thing that separates that intimacy. It's not rules. It's not rules. Sin just is this this smoke alarm that's going off to say, wait a minute, something's broken. And up to this point, nothing had been broken. So God has to send a gift, and you've never thought of it in this way. It says that Adam and Eve sin, and their eyes are opened from day one. Be careful what you want. You just might get it. From day one, their eyes are opened, and they become like God. Now, what do we do when we sin? Well, Adam and Eve set the pace for us. It says that they sew fig leaves together because they look down and they see that they're naked, which they didn't realize before, and they run and they hide. (laughs) Again, you would think to yourself, boy, that's pretty ludicrous. (laughs) Who in their right mind could hide from God? Ah, until you think back to those recurring Things in your life where you run and you hide and you think nobody knows. And then we try to cover it up and then we try to soften it. It's like taking a leaf. You know when you take a leaf off a tree, what happens to that leaf, right? (laughs) It dies. It starts to crumble, but that's what we do. We get sin in our life and we try to cover it ourselves. And we try to cover it with things as stupid as a little fig leaf. And we sew fig leaves together, not thinking that a day from now, that fig leaf will be dried up and crumpled and I will be naked and ashamed again. That's why shame came about, friends. Did you know shame is a gift? You've never heard or rarely do we think about shame as this gift. You see, Adam and Eve didn't have the understanding that something had been broken up to this point. God needed to let them know that something was broken. So he gives them the gift of shame, which is this dark feeling that always leads towards resurrection. Now see, guilt is from Satan. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Please do not confuse those two. Satan wants to make you feel bad about things that you shouldn't. As a bonus material number three, conviction will never happen about how you look or how many pounds you have. God doesn't give a rip about that. Now conviction may come about health, Be a little bit healthier. Move me towards wholeness, but it will never be about the outward. Conviction will always come with the sense that there is promise, that there is hope, but you have to know that something's wrong. And if you're feeling shamed about something that has happened to you, or you have been had, you know, you are the victim of something, that's guilt. That is not shame. That is not God. Let that go. But when that Holy Spirit comes and you know, oh, I've had that way too many times. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And that feeling comes deep in your heart and you go, you know something's broken. You got a choice to make. And Adam and Eve make that choice. They run and they hide and they try to cover themselves up. God answers this, and this is the most important part to me. What's God going to think about his kids when they've just messed up? Well, he comes with the first two questions that are recorded for humankind. The two questions are very simply this. Where are you and who told you that you were naked? Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Why would God ask those questions? Bonus material number four, when God asks a question, it's always for the benefit of the people he's asking. He already knows the answer. Why would God ask, where are you? Let me illustrate it this way. I am the father of three amazing, amazing daughters, all three uniquely made and considerably different from each other. And when they were little, we would play, like many of you, hide-and-seek in our little house. Now, when you're playing hide-and-seek with little kids, as you remember, there's three rules that are sort of unwritten, but everybody uh, uh, adheres to those rules. Number one, for the little kid, rule number one, hide-and-seek, the object is to get found. That'll preach all by itself. The object is to get found for a little kid. It is no fun for a little kid to play hide and seek and to stay lost the entire time. Number two, if your eyes are covered, you think your whole body is covered, right? You've played that with little kids. And number three, you typically hide in the same spot every time that you play. 
three really stupid rules that little kids play. So I want to be the good father, and I will sit on the couch, and my little girl will say, let's play hide and seek. I will count to 10, and I will say, ready or not, here I come. I open my eyes, and over to the side, my middle daughter, Brooklyn, has run to her spot. And her spot is a coat hook that is on the wall. We had coats hanging on the coat hook, and the coat hung down to here on her. So she is five feet away from me, runs over to the coat. She pulls the coat over her face and starts to laugh. I open my eyes. I say, ready or not, here I come. I open my eyes to see my three girls in the three spots that they go to every time. My middle daughter, five feet away from me with the coat over her face, giggling out loud. So, of course, you know what a good dad does. What's a good dad do? He says, you guys are the stupidest kids I have ever had. <laughs> this is the dumbest game I've ever played. You're supposed to be trying to hide from me. I can see you all. Stop the game. We're starting again. Find another place. And for crying out loud, Brooklyn, get the coat off of your face. Cover your whole body. <laughs> I can tell you, friends, that line of reasoning never crossed my mind. And yet some of you still think dad plays hide-and-seek that way. Some of you still think dad is waiting for you to mess up this really simple game, and he's just waiting to tell you how bad you're doing it. So as I said, when I say ready or not, here I come, what does a good dad do? He opens his eyes. He surveys the room. He sees his little girls all giggling out loud. Why? Because the object is to get found. And then he says these words. Then I say these words. Where's Brooklyn? Where's Danae? Where's Lacey? Why am I saying that? Because I don't know where they're at. Absolutely not. Because my girls need to know that dad thinks they're worth finding. Now listen, friends, when you put together that the object of the game is to get found and you recognize that there's a dad that wants to find you, you win. You win. That's all there is to it. You were created for intimacy. You were created for this intimacy for which God wants to take you and love you. And so I open my eyes and I say, where's Brooklyn? And what do I do? I run to Brooklyn and I take the little coat off of her eyes. And what does she do? She squeals with delight as dad grabs her in his arms, picks him up and hugs him. Because dad loves him. Dad's going to love him no matter what. He's a good, good father. And that's who he is. And you are loved by him. That's who you are. Live that way. Let that begin to determine your script. Then God comes and he says, who told you that you were naked? Why would he say that? Let me illustrate it this way. My stories today happen to all be about Brooklyn. Some of you still remember her. She played here back in the day soccer. And Brooklyn, when she was growing up, she was a tomboy. Don't know if we have any tomboys in the crowd. Brooklyn was a tomboy, never saw a dress, wore jeans the whole time. Most importantly, all the way growing up, she thought that boys were people that were her best buddies. So all of her little birthday parties included having all of the boys over to her house that would actually go swimming in our pond in the back with their clothes on as well as... Uh, playing basketball and all the things that her little girlfriends that liked Barbies would not do. Well, that changed, unfortunately, for Dad about her freshman year. <laughs> I, I wasn't all that happy about that. I had my little sidekick, and we would do all of our stuff together, but then she started to look at boys in a little bit different way. All of her girlfriends had been looking at boys in that way for some time, and up to this point, uh, we had avoided all of that. But she cast her eye upon this little guy I will viciously call Josh. <laughs> I'm so mad at him that that's his real name, just so you know. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Josh and she look at each other across the room and they do the stupidest thing. You guys still do this. I don't get it. They start talking. What is talking? <laughs> you guys have like 17 levels of talking that I do not understand. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Apparently, if you're talking, you're exclusive, but you're not dating, and I don't get that. Apparently, if you're talking, you're making out with each other, and you still don't call each other your boyfriend or girlfriend. Help me with this. I don't get this. I'm just call me old. 
just call me old. I get it. I know. So Brooklyn and Josh are talking. Now, as every mature freshman high school relationship, this lasts about three weeks. You, you know it has to. But here's the kicker. Josh didn't tell Brooklyn that he was done. Here's the way he decided to tell her. I know you guys have never done this. You're way more mature than this when you were in high school. But Josh goes to the high school dance this particular weekend and, as it is reported to me, begins to dirty dance with another girl while he's talking to Brooklyn. What, what is right? <laughs> begins to dirty dance with this girl. Now, I know that this didn't happen in your high schools, but it has, starts to happen here. Brooklyn had friends that were not too happy about that. They responded a lot like that. <laughs> gossip starts to happen in this school. Thank the Lord that you guys don't do this, but gossip started to happen in this school. And Josh's, to my glee, Josh's name was Mud. They weren't happy about this. Stuff starts to happen. This truly happens. Week later, two weeks later, it's the homecoming, snow coming, one of those things you put a crown on your head for some stupid reason. It's one, I don't, those are dumb too. Maybe you were queen, sorry. If you were queen, I love you, you're great. They're having the snow coming thing, and the way they do it, this is out at Western High School right here. The way they do it there is you elect a freshman king or representative, again, I don't get it, representative, but what you do is halftime of the basketball game, you're, you walk across there, the gym is full, and you're escorted by your parents. This, this happens, you can't make this up. Josh happens to be the representative for the school, for the freshman class. <clears throat> And so his mom, I think single mom, is escorting here, but his mom has heard from Josh, I suppose, the gossip that has started to happen about her son. Now, she doesn't have anything to holler about, right? He's the idiot, but she is going to protect her son. So they're, they're escorting, she's escorting across the gym floor, kid you not, and as she gets midway across the floor, she sees Brooklyn in the front row, and the mom points to my daughter and whispers, I'm going to get you. She does, this happens. So of course you know what I did. I walked over to her and I hit her in the face as hard as I could. I did. I didn't. I was the youth pastor. Youth pastors just let people holler at them as referees and get spit on. No, you can't do that. You got to be Christ in situations like this. Fortunately, I wasn't there. Maybe fortunately for her, fortunately for me. Brooklyn comes home and she says, Dad, you will not believe what just happened. She's all upset. And you know what I said, right? Who said that to you? Who told you that? Who told you that? Uh-uh. Now, you think I was bad. Mama Bear hears this from the side. <laughs> now, I told you I've had three girls, 17 female cats. I've been surrounded by estrogen my entire life. And I, I, let's just say I'm the calming influence in my house. Mama Bear is ready to jump into the car and go over to this woman's house and say, uh-uh. This is not going to happen. I talked her off the ledge and I said, I'll handle this. I'll handle this like a godly youth pastor. <laughs> and so I get on the phone with this lovely lady. And I, after 20 minutes of mature conversation, I in essence said this to her. You are not allowed to mess with my daughter. Now, you don't got to clap for that because all of you would do that exact same thing. But it's so illustrate what God is doing here. God comes up and says, who said that to you? You are not allowed to do this with my kids. Now, you're getting this, right? This is after the first sin, after the original sin. What's God say? I'm going to find you anyways. I'm going to come and seek you, and I'm going to find you. And nobody's allowed to mess with my kids. And he has some choice words. You see them there in Genesis chapter 3 for this little snake. You're not allowed to do that. But he has a secondary point in asking that question. You know what that point is, right? Because you and I got to reevaluate the voices that are telling us that we're not good 
then we're not enough. Wouldn't it be ludicrous if this mom got my daughter after that basketball game, took her into a room afterwards and said, hey, Brooklyn, I've changed. I love you. I really think that you should try some of this alcohol with me. You say, oh, that's the stupidest thing ever. You would never listen to an enemy like that, right? You'd never take their advice until you think back to the times you gave in. You see, friends, the answer is the same every time. Who told you that you were naked? It's a snake that does not have your best interest at heart, that lies and steals and destroys. So can I be God's voice for just a second? And can I ask you seriously, who told you that you're too fat? Who told you that you're defined by your past? Who told you? Who is telling you that you're not good? Who's telling you now? Is it dad on the sideline hollering, you're not enough? Those are the wrong voices. And God's coming and saying to you, who told you that? Stop. Pay attention. Who is it that is saying this to you? And if you will stop and pay attention, you will hear again that that voice is always the enemy. And that gives you the ability to listen to that shameful gift that you have and say, ah, no. But God's gifts aren't done. Not only does he say you're good, not only does he say you're enough, not only does he say even in your sin, I'm going to seek you and seek you and seek you, and nobody's going to mess with my kids. But then he says, those fig leaves won't do. You can't keep trying to cover it up yourself. Let me do something about that too. And so he goes and he gets a skin, right? It says he gives them a skin to cover their shame. Surely you have not missed that, right? What had to happen to get a skin for the first time? An animal had to die. Blood had to be shed to cover their sin. Ah, from day one, the message has been the same. Not only are you good, I made you that way. Not only are you enough, don't listen to those voices. I am going to find you. I am going to protect you. I'm going to help you identify the voices that are contrary to mine. And not only that, I'll provide a lifelong covering for your sin. Now, I know you because I know me. And you're thinking, Rick, it just can't be that good. I got to do something. I got to do something. You do. Do you know what you got to do? You got to start laughing. You got to change the game to wanting to be found. It's a heart condition. It's not coming up with the 20 things that you got to start doing and coming up with the 20 things you got to stop doing. Your heart changes and you move and you are inclined towards God and you say, Dad, I want to be found. And when you sin, because you will, you were created with that option. When you sin, what do you do? You just take the little coat off of your face. And you start to giggle and you say, I'm a bonehead. I am such a bonehead. Sorry. And what's God say? Yay. He runs over and he picks you up. Yay. And then you say, but what about this sin I did? And he says, what sin? forgot that already because that's not the point the sin isn't the point the point is that you incline your heart towards Jesus friends there is a dad on the sideline but he's not saying kick the ball better he's not saying you're not good he's not here enough he's saying on the side oh I love you oh the overwhelming reckless love of God wants you to view yourself as this dad on the sideline with his hands in the air cheering you on you guys have listened well. Love you, Jesus. Take this word. Put it in our hearts. Let us be men and women with a script defined by you, born out of the blueprint of us being good and us being enough, all because of what you have done. We love you today. Amen. Amen. Thanks, friends. You're dismissed.